So welcome everybody to this latest Social Contract Research Network uh, seminar. I think that today's talk is a particularly important seminar uh, in the ongoing series on the state of nature. And I just want to take a minute to explain why I think that is. It, it seems to me that the state of nature is customarily trained um, most often as a, a tool in order to reinforce the status quo. Um, it's a, a tool of colonialism and Barbara Arnale and others have written very persuasively on the, the way in which the state of nature motif works to reinforce um, uh, imperialism and colonialism. Um, and, and it's often framed therefore as a predominantly reactionary motif, um, a, a tool of those in power in order to reinforce and, and strengthen that power. Um, but this, I think, misses uh, a very important way in which the state of nature motif has functioned uh, over the centuries, and, and that is as a tool of emancipation uh, in the hands of those who want to challenge existing hierarchies and uh, upset the status quo. Uh, and uh, our speaker today, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to say, uh, is a great expert uh, in, in aspects of that use of the social contract. And I'm particularly grateful uh, and excited uh, to be hearing uh, from her today. Uh, our speaker is Professor Sarah Winter. Uh, she's Professor of English and Comparative Literary and Cultural Studies at the University of Connecticut and co-director of the Research Programme on Humanitarianism uh, at the University of Connecticut Human Rights Institute. Uh, she's a contributor as well to the recent book, uh, The State of Nature, Histories of an Idea, uh, edited by Mark Somos uh, and Anne Peters. And Sarah's title for today uh, is From Natural Equality to Frank Pledge, uh, The State of Nature, Ancient Constitutionalism, and the Rupture of the Social Contract in 18th Century Anti-Slavery Writings. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Winter. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thanks to all of you in attendance for getting up so early to hear my talk. Um, and I, I, I'm really interested to, to hear your responses. Um, my talk will be just over 50 minutes and I'll be sharing my PowerPoint so you can follow along with uh, quite a few of the quotations I'm going to read. So I'll start the sharing. Um, Okay. Um, can everyone see it? Okay. Okay, then I'll get right started. Between the 1750s and 1780s, three early anti-slavery writers, Anthony Benizet, Granville Sharp, and Thomas Clarkson, published influential tracts arguing that enslavement violates Africans' natural liberty as upheld by natural law. Although they all assume that the natural state of mankind must be one of equality, freedom and cooperation rather than a Hobbesian struggle of all against all. Their theories of the state of nature play a differing, often implicit role in their writings. Conceptions of the social contract based in biblical and ancient Greek and Roman sources or derived from theories of natural law and English common law maxims underpin their arguments that the slave trade and the unlawful regime of colonial slavery violate innocent Africans natural rights and must be abolished. While explicit references to theorists such as Grotius, Pufendorf, Montesquieu, Francis Hutcheson and William Blackstone appear in their texts, more frequently these writers rely on evidence grounded in the actual practices of the slave trade and colonial plantation system to indict the coercion and thus the absence of consent that undermine any basis for a valid social contract in slaveholding regimes. When examined in light of explicit or implicit state of nature theories, early anti-slavery arguments also reveal a common assumption that the slave trade ruptures the social contract, both in African polities and in Britain and its colonies, thus undermining the legitimacy of the imperial constitution and requiring far-reaching legal, political, moral, and social reforms 
to restore it. In different ways, all of these reformist writers depict colonial slaveholding societies as perpetrating a regime of localized and domesticated petty tyranny that encourages slaveholders impunity for uh, holding, uh, leading them to violate promises and contracts and commit aggressive acts ranging from theft and sexual assault to murder. On the imperial level, this vacuum of political legitimacy extends through the slave trade's onslaught into a virtual state of war with, against African societies. While Benazay's writings focus on defending Africans from unjust attacks on their capacity for ordered government, Clarkson's publications deploy an explicit theory of human equality in the state of nature to, pr to prove that human liberty by definition can never be bought or sold and that consent to such purchase is impossible. For Benazé and Clarkson, incursions by Europeans and their agents into African kingdoms to capture slaves provoke a return to the state of nature and natural equality, rendering Africans innocent victims of an assault on their natural rights. Sharp's writings are the most concerned with legal remedies for, of, for slavery of the three and provide an alternative constitutionalist framework for restoring the social contract in both Britain and its colonies. Sharp seems to have considered the ancient Anglo-Saxon constitution as a resource for every sort of egalitarian political reform. His detailed plan for a free settlement rather than a colony served by a chartered trading company founded for liberated Africans in Sierra Leone was a paternalistic ancient constitutionalist scheme through which he attempted to institute a social contract based in natural human equality that would abolish most distinctions of wealth, rank, and race. One of Sharp's key reforms was the adoption of the ancient English Frank Pledge, or a system of collective government and self-defense by means of militias, which he viewed as, quote, a glorious patriarchal system and the only effectual antidote to unlimited or illegal government of any kind. In contrast, the anti-slavery writings of two Afro-British former slaves, Alauda Equiano and Quobna Otoba Kuguano reveal the complicity of the wider British public in the legally sanctioned violence of the slave trade and the plantation system. Their personal narratives describing their kidnapping and enslavement evoke a state of nature represented by the innocence of childhood shattered when African agents of European slave merchants raided their homes. While they supported the abolitionist cause, both Kuguano's and Equiano's texts also indict British imperial governance by exposing the rampant property interests and transactional notions of freedom based in commercial calculations that pervaded colonial slaveholding societies. Early British anti-slavery writings have been carefully analyzed for their conceptual and propagandistic roles in humanitarian political reform campaigns, but it is also important to discern the political and legal philosophies incorporated into these works. I focus on what Mark Somos has called the analytical dimensions of state of nature theories. That is the way such theories enabled writers to pursue political, legal, and moral arguments. That is, uh, excuse me, without postulating that an actual state of nature had existed historically. These early writers evocations of the state of nature reveal three interwoven but distinct political reformist arguments that would come to characterize the Anglo-American uh, abolitionist movement. Benazé's approach, developed by Clarkson, launches abolitionism's appeals to humanitarian sentiments based in Scottish Enlightenment notions of an innate moral sense possessed by all human beings, often referred to as the conscience. Sharp's writings feature legalistic arguments for slave emancipation and abolition of the slave trade based in English statutes and legal authorities, as well as radical democratic thought. These alternative approaches would provide for British abolitionism a twofold framework of argumentation, featuring individually based moral regeneration collectivized through political action on the one hand, and representative notions of human rights as legal and political rights based in but distinct from natural law on the other. Equiano and Cuguano each reinforce these potential solutions while adopting the practical idea advocated by Benazé and Clarkson that the slave trade should be replaced by mutually beneficial commerce between British merchants and African states. But their writings 
also put forward a third strand of state of nature reasoning that is more skeptical, overtly anti-racist and po potentially radical by calling into question whether the entrenched economic interests underpinning slavery are amenable to political or moral reform. So let me focus now on these writers' major texts and arguments. Um, Anti-slavery activists in the mid 18th century initiated the inter international abolitionist movement by accusing those who sold and purchased slaves of unnatural and barbarous crimes against humanity, such as mass murder and human trafficking. Accounts of wars among African polities fomented by Europeans, as well as kidnappings, torture, massacres, assaults, and violations of the natural legal rights of Africans pervade two early 18th century Anglo-American anti-slavery texts. Philadelphia Quaker Anthony Benezes, a short account of that part of Africa inhabited by the Negroes, published in 1762, and Granville Sharp's A Representation of the Injustice and Dangerous Tendency of Tolerating Slavery in England, published in 1769. Benezes opens his tract by considering how the weakness and corruption of human nature render the passions of covetousness and pride into powerful counterforces against conscience. So that with the reinforcement of custom and the corrupting example of others, amplified by self-interest and the love of gain, Anglo-Americans, as he, as he suggests, reconcile ourselves to slavery's cruelties. Benazet reveals his source for this formulation when he later quotes Hutchison's account in his System of Moral Philosophy of 1755 of the unlawfulness of slavery because, quoting Hutchison, each man is the possessor of his own liberty, end quote. Contrary to ancient Greek and Roman conceptions of slavery, Hutchison argues that sparing the life of someone captured in war gives no man title to, quote, make him a slave and sell him as a piece of goods, or to keep a man's wife and children in perpetuity as slaves, an act that is most unjust and inhuman. Benese may have considered Hutchison as a pivotal authority for rejecting the enslavement of defeated enemies as a right of conquest, held by such natural law theor theorists as Grotius and Pufendorf, and echoed by later pro-slavery theorists. Benese also provides evidence from the European travelers' accounts um, testifying to Africans' industriousness, sociability, hospitality to strangers, and the peaceable mutual relations of their various kingdoms. To prove trafficked Africans' innocence in respect to the violence they suffer, Benazay quotes multiple eyewitness accounts by those involved in the African slave trade to document that the Europeans are the chief in instruments in inciting Africans to the perpetration of those unnatural wars, and I'm quoting Benazay, by which they are kept in continual alarms, their country laid waste, and such great numbers carried into captivity. Uh, Benazay continues, as a result of the tyranny, oppression, and cruelty with which this trade is prosecuted, all social connection and tender ties of nature being broken, desolation and bloodshed are continually fomented in those unhappy people's country. Benazay's use of a state of nature framework to target the slave trade as a rupture of the social contract of African societies becomes evident in his endorsement of a passage quoted from a 1760 anti-slavery pamphlet. Um, defending the natural equality of black-skinned Africans with white-skinned Europeans in terms uh, because they are being of the same species. So that one man in a state of nature, as we are with respect to the inhabitants of Guinea, and they with respect to us, is not superior to another man, nor has any authority or dominion over him, or any right to lay his commands upon him. Uh, this is a very rare text, and nobody really knows anything about the author, J. Fillmore. In such a natural law conception, the state of nature that establishes human equality persists as a moral framework supporting all human actions at all times, so that acts of violence leading to the enslavement of other human beings can be clearly seen as a violation of natural rights, regardless of any legal, commercial, or colonial imperatives that might seem to authorize them. In an expanded version of his text first published in 1771, Benazay discloses the diverse ways of life in what many Anglo-Americans referred to generically as the country of Africa or Guinea, 
through an account of the specific regions and people subject to the depredations of the slave trade. He provides more detailed evidence for the civility and resilience of African peoples, such as the Yalos, Fuli, and Mandingos living near the major rivers Senegal and Gambia. On impartial inquiry, Benazé asserts, we shall find that there is scarce a country in the whole world that is better calculated for affording the necessary comforts to its inhabitants with less solicitude and toil than Guinea, and that their economy and government is in many respects commendable. Without alluding explicitly to a state of nature theory, Benazé present, presents African societies as highly civilized and organizationally complex, thus indirectly defending their sovereignty against European slave merchants' incursions. Sharp's anti-slavery argument has a much more legalistic basis than Benazé's and focuses on constitutional questions. His first anti-slavery publication written in the context of a lawsuit instigated in 1767 by a slave owner in London against Sharp and his brother for their attempt to defend the freedom of a fugitive enslaved young man was, was this uh, text a representation. Um, the enslaved young man's name was Jonathan Strong. Sharp relies specifically on the protections afforded in the Habeas Corpus Act of 1679 against anyone's being seized and deported from England to assert that kidnapping of anyone, whether black or white, is a violation of the law. Sharp also criticizes the inhumane prejudices of slave owners who consider slaves, quote, as much private property as a horse or a dog, end quote. While he does not refer to the state of nature, in refuting the legality of slavery, Sharp does briefly entertain an analogy between free Africans in their own country and ferai bestiae, or wild animals. He asks the reader to pardon for the present the absurdity of such an idea, but then goes on to consider that Africans before they are enslaved, quote, had the same, had as much right to their natural liberty as wild animals with which their native country, Africa, abounds. Mark Somas has argued that Sharp's reference to ferai bestiae or ferai naturae was a weak argument, although it did apply, imply that, quote, even if they were considered as wild animals, they would be free when not owned, since no one can claim absolute property in them. Sharp quickly abandons this line of an analysis, however, to dispute the applicability to anyone in England of colonial conceptions of property claimed by slaveholders asserting that, quote, the comparing of a man to a beast at any rate is unnatural and unjust, end quote, for purported slaveholders would have to prove that an enslaved person, quote, is neither man, woman, nor child. And if they are not able to do this, how can they presume to consider such a person as a mere shows in action or a thing to be demanded in a legal action, end quote. To the contrary, Sharp contends that formerly Enslaved Africans such as Jonathan Strong are the king's subjects like all others residing in England and thus ha have a just right to the protection of the law, including habeas corpus when unlawfully detained. Sharp takes particular care to disprove the related notion that a bill of sale for a slave can function as a valid labor contract since the perpetual service of a slave cannot with propriety be compared to the temporary service of an apprentice because the latter is due only in consequence of a voluntary contract, wherein both parties have a mutual advantage. But in the former case, there is no contract, neither can a contract be even implied, because the free consent of both parties cannot possibly be implied likewise. And without this, every kind of contract in the very nature and idea of such an obligation is absolutely null and void. Since Sharp derives these arguments concerning slavery's disqualification as a contractual obligation from common law sources, we can note the absence of explicit references to the state of nature while discerning that consent and voluntary contract remain key concepts in Sharp's anti-slavery critique, underpinning his objections to colonial slave regimes. Sharp was likely drawing on William Blackstone's theory of constitutional rights as deriving from natural rights in book one of his Commentaries on the Laws of England, of the Rights of Persons, published in 1765, which Sharp cites in various parts of his argument. Although Blackstone does not endorse the literal truth of social contract theories, he too conceives of society as having a contractual basis, 
quote, every man when he enters into society gives up a part of his natural liberty as the price of so valuable a purchase of that political or civil, civil liberty, which is infinitely more desirable than that wild and savage liberty, which is sacrificed to obtain it, end quote. Nevertheless, municipal or civil law must still safeguard what Blackstone calls the absolute rights of individuals, quote, such as would belong to their persons merely in a state of nature and which every man is entitled to enjoy whether out of society or in it. Expressing the natural li liberty of mankind, these are absolute rights to personal security or a person's legal and uninterrupted enjoyment of his life, his limbs, his body, his health, and his reputation. That's all Blackstone. Such notions of natural rights as vested in the human body and forming the basis of common law and constitutional rights are implied throughout Sharp's tract, particularly in his repeated disqualification of, of colonial slave laws that indemnify slaveholders for inflicting bodily harm, including murder on their purported human property. Sharp shared his tract in draft with eminent lawyers and jurists, including Blackstone, and it became an influential text consulted by anti-slavery lawyers. Thomas Clarkson used state of nature theories more extensively than Sharp or Benizé. Unlike their independently authored texts, Clarkson's early anti-slavery text originated in an academic setting. After completing his BA in 1783 at St. John's Cambridge, Clarkson decided to become a clergyman. While furthering his religious studies, he entered the Latin prize competition in 1785 to the set topic, is it lawful to enslave the unconsenting? Clark Clarkson's prize-winning essay focusing on the African slave trade was translated into English and published as an essay on the slavery and commerce of the human species, particularly the African in 1786. A second enlarged edition studied here followed in 1788 that answered doubts concerning the accuracy of his first edition by providing more detailed documentation of the Atlantic commerce in slaves carried out by British merchants based in Clarkson's personal research including inspecting slave ships and interviewing their crews and other participants in the trade. Clarkson's treatise is explicitly focused on recuperating imperial governance by ending the slave trade. In the first part, Clarkson draws on many Greek and Latin sources to recount how the ancient slavery of the Greeks and Romans was introduced as a practice derived from conquest and commerce. Buying and selling human beings as property like cattle led to considering the enslaved as inferior brutes or barbarians. Referring to Aristotle's disparaging characterization of barbarians in the politics, quote, so low were their capacities, they were defined by nature to obey and to live in a state of perpetual drudgery and subjugation, end quote. Clarkson criticizes this notion of the natural slave often endorsed by pro-slavery writers. To show the mere vanity of the Greeks assertion of their natural right to dominion over barbarians, Clarkson offers examples of celebrated ancient writers who were born slaves, including Aesop, Alcman, Epictetus, and Terence. Clarkson applies state of nature theories to African societies under siege by slave traders in the second part of his, series, of his treatise, which also surveys conditions of enslavement within African societies. Pointing to both biblical and classical sources, Clarkson asserts, Quote, it appears that mankind were originally free and that they possessed an equal right to the soil and produce of the earth. To explain the history of modern servitude in the context of the rights of empires, he relies on a stadial conception of history from Roman historians, such as Sallust and Tacitus, to chart an exit from the state of nature. He draws an analogy between Franco-Germanic tribes during the Roman Empire whose way of life exhibited a state of settled subordinate society and contemporary African nations in order to make the case that a leader could only emerge by consent of the group because no individual could truly dominate all others by force alone. An empire then could never have been gained at first by compulsion, so it could only be gained by consent. And as men were then going to make an important sacrifice for the sake of their mutual happiness, so he alone could have obtained it not whose ambition had greatly distinguished him from the rest, but in whose wisdom, justice, prudence, and virtue, the whole community could confide. 
Clarkson, Clarkson draws the conclusion that, quote, liberty is a natural and government an adventitious right because all men were originally free, end quote, so that legitimate government must be based in a contract subject to various restrictions, the central purpose of which for Clarkson is the happiness of the people. Because all possess their own bodies as a natural right, quote, no just man can be justly consigned to slavery without his own consent. A just empire for Clarkson, therefore, is based in consent of the governed. So a ruler or agent of empire who deprives anyone of liberty without their consent has violated the contract underpinning imperial rule, rendering it illegitimate because incapable of guaranteeing general happiness. At this point in his state of nature analysis, however, Clarkson shifts African peoples from their position within his stadial account where they exist in a state of subordination in relation to expanding European empires into a theoretical state of nature where their natural rights as individuals are violated by a commercial conquest that perpetrates an unjust and fabricated right of empire upon them by attempting to render them into property. But if kings then to whom their own people have granted dominion and power are unable to invade the liberties of their harmless subjects without the highest injustice, how can those private persons be justified who treacherously lie in wait for their fellow creatures and sell them into slavery? What arguments can they possibly bring in their defense? What treaty of empire can they produce by which their innocent victims ever resign to them the least portion of their liberty? Impious and abandoned men, ye invade the liberties of those who, with respect to your impious selves, are in a state of nature, in a state of original dissociation, perfectly independent, perfectly free. The slave merchant, therefore, quote, acts surely as if the use of empire consisted in violence and oppression. As Benazay had argued, the slave traders' assaults on Africans in order to enslave them reconstitutes a state of nature in which Africans must be considered as perfectly free and equal to their attackers and therefore entitled to defend themselves. By placing the enslaved Africans theoretically outside of any government, however, Clarkson also detaches slavery and the slave trade from imperial rule itself, making these adventitious commercial ventures an inhumane and unlawful aberration and one that can and must be excised from British imperial governments. Clarkson's account of Africans' human equality and innocence of any wrong in a state of nature undermined common arguments among pro-slavery writers, such as the Jamaica planter Edward Long in his three-volume History of Jamaica, published in 1774, that slaves obtained from Africa for the colonial plantations were not kidnapped, but instead were condemned criminals, captives in African wars, or enslaved persons resold by other Africans, or even, quote, sold by their brutal parents or husbands, end quote. Long, whose works Clarkson could have read though does not cite, alludes to the theory of the natural slave by arguing that, quote, as the Africans are naturally thieves and villains, though slavery is the certain punishment now on their conviction, the breaking up of the slave trade might indeed alter the punishment to that of death, but would not reform them, end quote. By dismissing the possibility of reforming condemned Africans morally, Long not only justifies the slave trade, but also forecloses the anti-slavery argument that the violence of colonial slavery de delegitimizes the British Empire and necessitates its, its reform. Long even claims that despite the deaths due to disease and harsh discipline that regularly take place among Africans on slave ships, deportation to the colonial plantations still amounts to rescue from certain execution. He also defends the use of shackles and other harsh measures on slave ships due to the danger of slave mutinies, quote, this rigor is wholly chargeable on their bloody and malicious disposition, which calls for the same confinement as if they were wolves or wild boars, end quote. For the overtly racist long, considering Africans as ferae bestiae justifies their harsh treatment as a kind of property. Possibly alluding to pro-slavery arguments such as long's, Clarkson also considers slave rebellions in a contractual light. He attacks the injustice of colonial slaveholders, characterizations of Africans as naturally criminal and rebellious. Quote, if then these enslaved Africans are your subjects, you violate laws of government by making them unhappy. But if they are not your subjects, then even though they should resist your proceedings, they are not rebellious. 
For Clarkson then, contending that enslaved Africans in the colonies have reverted to a state of nature, postulated a blank slate within which punitive colonial slave laws that were widely understood by ab abolitionists to violate English law could be rendered null and void so that British constitutional norms could be reinserted into the colonies by the abolition of the slave trade. Invoking feelings of indignation, followed by tears of sympathy and sighs of commiseration in contemplating the vast scale of human suffering, of the nine millions of Africans torn from their dearest connections and sold into slavery, these are Clarkson's words, he amplified the impact of his state of nature theory by appealing to his readers innate moral sentiments considered equally as, quote, a genuine production of nature. For the former slaves, Cucuano and Equiano, African, Africa was a homeland from which they had been abducted and deported. Both of them advertised the authenticity of their narratives as written by an African. Yet their accounts confirm in certain ways what Benazay's and Clarkson's uses of state of nature theory revealed about the slave trade's violation of the social contract in Africa. Cugoano and Equiano were both members of the Sons of Africa, an abolitionist group of educated free blacks residing in London and allied with the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, which included both Clarkson and Sharp. Both abolitionist groups were established in 1787 with their separate organizations suggesting a segregation of members by color and class but also a distinctive development of black British political activism. Published in the immediate context of these organizational efforts, Cugoano's thoughts and sentiments of the evil and wicked traffic of the slavery and commerce of the human species, humbly submitted to the inhabitants of Great Britain, published in 1787, opens with an expression of gratitude toward other anti-slavery writers. He refers to Benazay's, Clarkson's and Sharp's work as well as to other contemporary anti-slavery texts. But Cugoano distinguishes his contribution by implying that his personal experience of enslavement is reflected in his discourse. He claims that such laws as may exist among, quote, the robbers of men, the kidnappers, ensnarers, and slaveholders prove nothing more than that there may be some honesty among thieves. He admits that, quote, this may seem a harsh comparison, but the parallel is so coincident that I must say I can find no other way of expressing my thoughts and sentiments without making use of some harsh words in comparison against the carriers on of such abandoned wickedness. Kugoano ties his radical attack on slave traffickers directly to the violence they have committed against him. Kugoano pursues his biting Christian polemic by undermining European hypocrisy and the prejudicial ways that moral associations assigned symbolically in religious discourse to whiteness and blackness have been applied to skin color. In referring to the men who kidnapped him to sell him into slavery, he leaves their origins, whether African or European, ambiguous. If such men can boast of greater degrees of knowledge than any African is entitled to, I shall let them enjoy all the advantages of it unenvied, as I fear it consists only in a greater share of infidelity and that of a blacker kind than only skin deep. And if their complexion be not what I may suppose, it, it is at least the nearest in resemblance to an infernal hue. A good man will neither speak nor do as a bad man will. But if a man is bad, it makes no difference whether he be a black or a white devil. By some of such complexion as whether black or white, it matters not. I was early snatched away from my native country with about 18 or 20 more boys and girls as we were playing in a field. The scene of Kugoano's kidnapping, while presented as autobiographical and therefore factual, has been abstracted somewhat by the omission of certain details, such as the identity of the kidnappers. In the context of the other abolitionists' state of nature theorizing, the passage seems biblically inspired, representing an emblematic setting of a peaceful Edenic natural state where African children's innocence and their natural rights are violated by devils in human form. As Kukuano pursues his narrative, however, after mentioning his birth in the city of Agamakwe, located on the coast of Fantin in present day Ghana, and his father's status as a companion to a Fante chief, he reveals that his abductors were Africans who separated the children into smaller groups, 
tricked them into compliance by promising to take them to a feast and then transferred them to men whose language differed from ours. As he continued to travel with these men, he was repeatedly promised that he would be returned to his family. But instead he was conveyed to a coastal city or slave factory where he joined many other imprisoned captives and he was ultimately transferred to a slave ship bound for Grenada. Declining to describe all the horrible scenes which we saw and the base treatment with which we met in this dreadful captive situation, cruelties afflicting other thousands of other enslaved Africans, Kugoano recurs to his initial depiction of the peaceful scene of his entrapment. Let it suffice to say that I was thus lost to my dear indulgent parents and relations and they to me. All my help was cries and tears and these could not avail nor, nor suffered long till one succeeding woe and dread swelled up another. Brought from a state of innocence and freedom and in a barbarous and cruel manner conveyed to a state of horror and slavery. This abandoned situation may be easier conceived than described. Communicating the powerful grief of an abducted child and his bereft parents through the language of moral sentiments shared with Benize and Clarkson, Kugoano strengthens the abolitionist argument that Africans are forced from a state of natural equality and freedom into a state of bondage. But he also adds an admission, quote, to the shame of my countrymen that I was first kidnapped and betrayed by some of my own complexion who were the first cause of my exile and slavery. But he stipulates that if there were no buyers, there would be no sellers. Like Benazay's accusation that Europeans have brought mass murder, human trafficking and wars to Africa, Kugoano's bitter personal account, despite his gratitude for his conversion to Christianity, shows that no natural innocence beyond that of childhood can survive in the regions of Africa penetrated by the slave trade or in the colonial plantations supported by, quote, the great and opulent banditti of slaveholders in the Western part of the world. Kuguano vigorous, vigorously defends the natural rights of enslaved Africans and asserts that they, quote, are born as free and brought up with as great a predilection for their own country, freedom and liberty as the sons and daughters of Fair Britain. He alludes to the universality of a social contract in all countries, linking it with the biblical golden rule to argue that um, in Kuguano's words, a free, voluntary, and sociable servitude, which is the very basis of human society, either civil or religious, in an, is in all things requisite and agreeable to all law and justice. Both the enslaved person's resistance to being bought and sold without his own consent and a punishment of the robber of freedom by enslaving him in turn are just retributions for slavery's violence, according to Kuguano. But he also wonders more radically what sort of revolution will finally defeat slavery, whether a voluntary dissolution followed by the slaveholders making, quote, restitution for the injuries that they have already done, or a divine vengeance resulting in the destruction and overthrow of the transgressors. In the context of his attack on the greed and profits driving the slave trade, Kugoano's notion of restitution envisions financial as well as legal compensation to those unlawfully trafficked and exploited. Pointing out that commercial relations and colonial settlements could have been established with other nations peacefully by treaty, he also condemns what he calls the barbarous inhuman Europeans, um, and to quote his words, for their treatment of the various Indian nations, stating as a certain general fact that all their foreign settlements and colonies were founded on murders and devastations, and that they have continued their depredations in cruel slavery and oppression to this day. Um, for Kugawano, this conquest and violence renders uh, European empires illegitimate. Um, Kugawano escaped the, the rigors of slavery in Grenada due to his purchase by a West Indian planter, Alexander Campbell, who took him to England and enabled him to be educated. Baptized in London in 1773, Kugoano likely emancipated himself in the wake of the Somerset decision um, of 1772. That was a decision in which uh, a fugitive slave um, was freed um, by declaration of, of the High Court of King's Bench. In the interesting narrative of the life of the Lauda Equiano or Gustavus Bassa, the African written by himself published in 1789, Equiano recounts how in 1776, at the age of 21, he purchased his freedom from his master, a Quaker merchant from Philadelphia named Robert King, for 40 pounds sterling with his earnings from engaging in trade on his own behalf during his enslavement. 
While Cugoano's text can be viewed as a work of political theory and critique, Aquiano shapes his contribution to the anti-slavery cause. It was dedicated to the members of the House of Commons in the form of a spiritual autobiography so that his observations on commerce, law, and slavery unfold as he narrates his experiences and conversion to Christianity. Aquiano's account of his childhood as the son of an Igbo Ombrenke, a chief and local judge in the kingdom of Benin, is highly detailed and resembles Benazé's descriptions of African societies and customs in his text, Some Historical Account of Guinea, which Aquiano cites. Aquiano's biographer, Vincent Coretta, raises doubts about the authenticity of Aquiano's claim to have been born in Africa, based on his baptismal and naval records stating his birthplace as South Carolina. Even if partially fictional, Aquiano's recollections of an African childhood would be analogous to the hypothetical state of nature theories of other abolitionist writers, and also served the text's key purpose to support the abolitionist movement by contributing an, a formerly enslaved African's testimony. Although he refers to Clarkson's text and most likely also read Cugoano's, a depiction of Africa in a state of nature is only very subtly present in Equiano's narrative of his abduction. He recounts that when he was 11 years old, while his parents were absent, he was playing at home with his sister when slave raiders suddenly climbed over the walls of his family compound. He and his sister were seized and transported in large sacks and gagged so that they could not cry for help. On the following day, the grief-stricken children were separated and Equiano was carried into a distant country and sold to another African family whose language, however, he still understood. At one point, he attempted to escape into the woods with plans to find his way back to his parents. But while hiding, he heard the searchers discuss how far away his home was and he lost all hope of return. I began to consider that if possibly I could escape all other animals, I could not those of the human kind and that not knowing the way I must perish in the woods. Thus, I was like the hunted deer. Every leap, leaf and every whispering breath conveyed a foe and every foe a death. A similar deconstruction of a pro-slavery trope occurs here to Kugoano's disentanglement of skin color from estimations of sin or moral worth. Kugoano shows that human animals are more dangerous than ferai bestiae. Demonstrating his sophisticated literacy and self-culture through his quotation of verse to evoke his plight, Equiano's critique of the common European rationale for empire as a civilizing project comes in a poetic form that also disproves slaveholders' racist disparagement of Africans as natural slaves. In Equiano's account, the African social contract seems susceptible to exploitation by the Atlantic trade's commercial incentives. The Igbo's milder form of slavery, however, has been rendered more violent by the European slave trade. In the context of recounting his transportation to the coast, Equiano, like Cugoano, admits fellow Africans' involvement in procuring slaves for Europeans. But he adds that, quote, I must acknowledge in honor of those sable destroyers of human rights, that I never met with any ill treatment or saw any offered to their slaves except tying them when necessary to keep them from running away. Many months later, he was delivered over to a European slave ship and inducted into the brutality of the Middle Passage, experiences which his narrative described in, describes in detail. Equiano's notion that Africans' human rights are violated by slave traders emerges within a context indicating that African societies like the Igbos have a government and therefore are not in a state of nature. His account thus implies that such human rights are not simply natural rights, but also legal and political rights belonging to subjects of African states. Like Clarkson, Equiano attacks slaveholders' systematic violation of, quote, that first natural right of mankind, equality and independency, and their usurping of a dominion over his fellows which God could never intend. But in more specific terms than the other writers, Equiano depicts his personal experiences of slaveholders' exploitation of forced labor for profit. Equiano shows how slavery financially incentivizes cruelty and violence when he attacks male slaveholders' common practice of sexual assault on female slaves and even their lack of shame in populating their plantations with their own progeny. Instead of imagining slave revolts or aversion to a state of nature in which resistance would be justified, however, Equiano frequently makes claim to his right to the wages of his labor that were appropriated by his masters. 
Even his own ability to purchase his freedom is framed ironically as a good bargain for his master's investment in slave property. When a ship captain who had subcontracted Equiano's labor to assist him on his trading voyages persuades King to follow through on his pledge to free Equiano when he hesitates to fulfill it. You have laid your money out very well. You have received good interest for it all this time. And here is now the principal at last. The interest received refers to Equiano's wages paid by the captain directly to King. Equiano must still discharge the 40 pounds principal given for his purchase by his master, as if it had been a mortgage on his life or a debt imposed on his natural birthright to freedom. In a subtle critique, Equiano puns on the replacement of the legitimate political and natural law principles of justice, equality, and freedom and remuneration for one's labor by the financial principle materialized in the illegitimate contract of sale for an enslaved human being. Robert King was tempted to break his promise to allow Equiano to purchase his freedom because slaveholding had no basis in a contract with the slave that the master was bound to honor. Thus Equiano's narrative presents the imperial commercial system as potentially impervious to the fundamental moral, social, and political reforms that anti-slavery writers advocated. Prefiguring the monetary compensation to slaveholders that would follow British parliamentary abolition of slavery in 1833 to 834, the text also exposes the injustice of the financial transaction required to regain one's human rights and freedom lawfully within such a system. Equiano's invocation of Africans violated human rights, combined with his frequent crises of conscience, conscious, uh, sorry, conscience as a witness to the atrocities of the slave trade, also make his own story potentially representative of the need for a supervening universal jurisdiction of conscience that could adjudicate on behalf of enslaved Africans against imperial commercial interests. Sharp turned in the 1790s to constitutional experimentation after his legal activism failed to bring about a definitive declaration from English courts that slavery was illegal. His subsequent ancient constitutionalist project for Sierra Leone, funded in part by the British treasury, sought to reconstruct formerly enslaved Africans natural freedom and rights by equalizing property relations through a highly contrived and tutelary social contract. A major abolitionist goal of the settlement was to show that sugar and other crops could be produced profitably by free black laborers. No longer considered as human property, the British black poor, as they were called, were to become landowners, landowners in the new Sierra Leone settlement. This is Sharp's plan for the town that should be established there. While Sharp does not refer to a state of nature in a short sketch of temporary regulations until better shall be proposed for the intended settlement on the grain coast of Africa near Sierra Leona, published in 1786, his project envisions a model of democratic governance that would seek to rectify the imperial social contract ruptured by the Atlantic trade, particularly the dependence on coerced labor of plantations founded under British colonial charters. The constitutional arrangements Sharp proposed for the free settlement included the lawful purchase of settlement land from the African inhabitants by the crown, followed by gratis allocation of land for houses and cultivation, apportioned equally to male heads of households and single settlers. A significant percentage of plots of land allotted to the settlement collectively as commons. The prohibition of slavery and automatic freedom extended to all fugitive slaves. A jury system and elected public council to take all important decisions collectively, including to amend the constitution. And Frank Pledge, based in the organization of settlers into hundreds that would co cooperatively enforce mutual sureties for debts and labor shares and provide settler militias for collective self-defense. When conjoined with proprietorship in land, Frank Pledge would guarantee self-government for the free black settlers, since by this means they could avoid relying on military forces supplied directly by the British government or by a chartered trading company. Sharp's intricate measures codified constitutional pr principles that he had also articulated in his support for the American colonists in their demand for legislative representation a position he continued to pursue through his activities as a member of the Society for Constitutional Information, founded in 1780 to advocate for constitutional reform in Britain. 
Founded in 1787, the Sierra Leone settlement at St. George's Bay was populated primarily from poor blacks from London, by poor blacks from London, as well as loyal blacks from North America who had been freed from slavery after fighting for the British side in the American Revolutionary War and who afterwards settled in Nova Scotia under conditions of extreme poverty. The three, free settlement itself was to be situated, however, in a kind of quarantine within the larger confines of a slave trading region in Africa and the even more extensive spheres of the competitive European systems of Atlantic slavery. Commenting on the decision of some of the prospective black settlers to back out of the immigration scheme before the ship's departure from London for Sierra Leone, Kogoano implies that their second thoughts were warranted. As the old saying is, a burnt child dreads fire. Some of these unfortunate sons and daughters of Africa have been severally unlawfully dragged away from their native abodes by the insidious treachery of others. They are afraid of being ensnared again, for the European seafaring people in general who trade to foreign parts have such a prejudice against black people that they use them more like asses than men. For can it be readily conceived that government would establish a free colony for them nearly on the spot while it supports its forts and garrisons to ensnare, merchandise, and to carry others into captivity and slavery? The black settlers had shrewdly taken measures in regard to this precarious situation prior to their departure by insisting that they receive certificates bearing royal arms, proving their free status as loyal British subjects. Equiano was appointed in London to serve as commissary, overseeing the equipping of the ships with supplies. However, he was dismissed from this post after he had complained of mismanagement of government funds by suppliers. He had also been particularly vocal in representing the grievances of the remaining black settlers who had been confined on the ships prior to their departure and suffered from an outbreak of, theater, of fever. Equiano's dis disillusionment went with and Cugoano's suspicions of the scheme were preludes to the misfortune of the first group of settlers, which began when many died from malaria due to their arrival at Sierra Leone during the rainy season. I'll go back to the, to the map. Despite some conscientious efforts by the settlers, Sharp's detailed governmental scheme, including Frank Ledge, was not implemented and a series of other unfortunate events ensued. Slave traders operating near the settlement attempted to seize several black settlers and some settlers became involved in the trade themselves. Once finally established and resupplied through Sharp's initiative, Granville town was burned down in 1790 on the or orders of the local Koya Temne subchief in reprisal for ongoing hostilities with some of the settlers. After his intensive organizational efforts and spending 1,400 pounds of his own funds, Sharp could not raise more financial assistance. In order to rebuild the settlement, he was obliged to accept the collapse of his constitutional plan and to support the settlement's incorporation under a, a chartered company. Firmly shifting its identity into a colony and commercial enterprise governed by a board of white abolitionist directors to which Sharp was duly elected. Such an outcome overturned the egalitarian political goals of Sharp's project. As he wrote to an interested friend in 1791, the settlers had lost their proprietorship of the entire district since the chartered Sierra Leone company had now been granted the land. They no longer had the right to elect their own governor and officers, quote, nor any other circumstances of perfect freedom proposed in the regulations. All these privileges are now submitted to the appointment and control of the company and no settler can trade independently of it, end quote. He acknowledged that, quote, I could not prevent this humiliating change but all slavery and the oppression of involuntary labor are absolutely prohibited and the laws of England are to be established. Sharp's attempt to guarantee freedom and self-determination for black settlers in Sierra Leone amidst a rampant slave trade thus appeared as a kind of allegory for Britain's own false position in claiming to uphold the rule of law and guarantee its subjects political rights and personal freedom while carrying on slavery and the slave trade in its imperial dominions. So to conclude, collectively the state of nature arguments of these anti-slavery texts bring to light how the transactional commercial nature of the imperial social relations enforced by slavery, experienced by enslaved Africans through their being merchandised, as Kugoano put it, rendered the violent inequalities imposed by the colonial plantation system highly flexible and resilient due to their economic basis and therefore resistant to schemes for political reform. 
contracts of sale and colonial charters leading to legalized regimes of slavery had effectively replaced constitutional protections of the rights of subjects so that natural law became a highly abstracted foundation for the common law in colonial and imperial settings. And the common law itself was revealed to Sharpe's dismay as an optional and restricted component of imperial governance. While Benazay and Clarkson formulated the appeals to innate moral sentiments of humanity that would predominate within the political rhetoric of the organized abolitionist movement, Sharpe's constitutionalism was left in a stark confrontation with the jurisdictional limitations of the common law and the financial dependence of the colonial system on chartered trading companies. On a more positive side for the anti-slavery cause, a theoretical assertion such as Clarkson's of Africans' perfect freedom in the state of nature exposed the lack of a just social contract based in consent of the governed across British dominions where slavery was practiced and therefore rebounding into Britain itself. In retrospect, and despite the scheme's paternalism, Sharp's provision for equal distribution of property and land was also distinctive for its potential to promote citizenship of free black settlers at Sierra Leone, particularly in comparison to the apprenticeship system implemented after the 1834 abolition of slavery in British dominions. That uh, apprenticeship, uh, apprenticeship system was intended to constrain the emancipated black peasantry within regimes of free labor on existing plantations. Anti-slavery writers resort to both claims concerning slaves' natural rights and state of nature theories, reveal how the foundations of political rights and property ownership under both the common law and colonial regimes undermined early anti-slavery arguments based in legal and moral principles, perhaps causing their sentimental appeals to, come, to become more dominant as the abolitionist movement accelerated. Having been abused as human property, Equiano and Cugoano experienced this contradiction most acutely. Equiano's invocation of the collective human rights of enslaved Africans nevertheless suggests that Sharp's legalistic and constitutional approach to outlawing slavery, combined with the personal narratives and testimony of former slaves, could form the basis of a representative political argument for the enslaved to move beyond natural rights and sentimental appeals by claiming the fundamental rights of British subjects and citizens, including property ownership. Implying that access to the rights of subjects would not adequately compensate enslaved Africans, however, Kugoano's demand for reparations presents the most radical expectation, arising in part from state of nature theorizing, that victims of murders, kidnappings, and wars against Africans and indigenous peoples in colonized regions might finally receive a comprehensive financial settlement from the national and corporate entities that benefited from Atlantic slavery. So that's the end of my presentation. And I'll thank you very, hope that very was much. Clear for everyone. It certainly was, and uh, more than fulfilled all the hopes I had uh, for when I invited you. So that was absolutely wonderful. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, very, was, very important set really of nice concerns. Um, uh, and and uh, presented uh, with with great force and clarity. Thank you so much. We're we're going to move to a time of um, uh, discussion, question and answer now. Um, if you have a question, can I invite you to raise your hand in the usual Zoomish way, um, and uh, I will invite you to ask your question. Uh, viva voce. Uh, I I might start just to give people a, a chance to. Uh, reflect on what questions they might have. I, I might start with a, a question that begins uh, by moving to the, the quote from Fillmore um, that you, uh -huh. you shared about a third of the yeah. way through the um, yeah. presentation. Uh, and I, I don't know if I've copied it down correctly here, but one man in a state of nature, as we are with respect to the inhabitants of Guinea and yes. they with respect to us, Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was that reciprocity that mm -hmm. intrigued me. Is that yeah. a reference to the something like the international state of nature, where 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 different states are considered to be in a state of nature oh, with yes. each other? That's possible. Yes, I had I hadn't really uh, thought of that because the international law or the um, aspects of the quote really haven't didn't sort of don't emerge in the other writers. 
as much, but, but that would be a wonderful way to, to think about that. Um, and that would just sort of lead us back to Grotius and Pufendorf and you know, some of these major theorists who were at the foundations of international law. Um, and so that, that makes sense though. I mean, if you were to sort of do more with that quote um, than I did, you could, you could really say more about all of the claims that Kuguano and Equiano make um, in relation to, you know, the improper uh, conduct of the European powers, you know, that they could have created treaties, you know, they could have developed civilized trade, and instead they're basically, you know, perpetrating conquest. Um, and so I, I, I really, I really appreciate that observation. I mean, Fillmore, you know, one could do a lot more with him. In fact, it's possible that that text was extremely important um, to all of these early theorists, um, there is a, uh, an essay by um, David Bryan Davis where he talks about Fillmore and also George Wallace, who was another um, early anti-slavery writer. He was a, a Scottish lawyer, and he also came up with a with a um, an argument against slavery. Uh, both of those they published. Both of them published their work in 1760. Um, Sharp doesn't cite them. I don't know that Sharp knows Wallace at all. Um, so, but I think I think your insight is really um, really useful, um, and so, something could definitely more could definitely be done with that idea. Do you have further thoughts about it? Um, not not on that. It just intrigued me because I'd never seen mm -hmm. the state of nature used in that way before. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that yeah. Karen has her hand up. If I could just have a very quick follow-up and then I'll hand over to Karen for, for the next question. Um, further on in that same quotation, it says that, that the state of nature is, is, is a reason for um, the, the colonizers to have no right to lay commands on him, uh, him referring to, to, to the colonized yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and what struck me about that is that Locke, John Locke, almost uses precisely the same yeah. basis to reach the opposite conclusion, that he uses <laughs> the idea of natural law to mm -hmm. gain purchase on those who are not under a national jurisdiction. So, you know, you're yeah. enforcing natural law. And so I was wondering yeah. if, if those two different interpretations ever talked to each other, if there was ever any, ever, ever any discussion between those very different ways of, of passing out um, yes. the state of nature in relation to these debates? Um, I have a, just a short mention of Locke that I cut out of the talk in which I, I, I suggest that Locke seems to be very much behind the scenes in a lot of this theorizing and yet Locke doesn't get mentioned. And Clarkson's treatise is very, is very learned. He cites all kinds of classical writers and he doesn't do as much with modern political writers, but it, 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 it makes me wonder why Locke is not mentioned. And the only thing I could come up with is that perhaps Locke was known um, by these uh, anti-slavery writers as someone who had condoned slavery. Um, he was one of the authors of the, um, of the Constitutions of Carolina. And um, it's possible that his reputation you know, was still there as somebody who, who had condoned slavery. And, you know, from the second treatise, it's possible too that, you know, people drew that conclusion. Um, so, so yes, the exact opposite um, uses of natural law. So that, so that natural law, this is one reason why, I mean, Sharp's constant invocations of natural law really are, are then, folded into his constant reference to common law and common law maxims and statutes. And I think he believes ultimately that this is a, a more solid foundation for at least his early efforts to overthrow both the slave trade and slavery through the courts. So I don't know that he's all, he would either be somebody who would consider that natural law would be enough, right, to make this happen. Um, I, I, you know, so I mean, I thought a lot about Locke's uh, second treatise and what he does with the with the um, with the bill of sale. You know, the idea of the um, what does he call it? The uh, 
the natural right to one's labor as almost a title, a natural title. Uh, I think that's what he claims. And this is something that I think makes us understand how important it was that these early writers, especially Sharp, were so adamantly opposed to any acceptance of a bill of sale as a contract because they were aware that that was what was being claimed and that that you know they just could, that couldn't be permitted because it would be completely uh, in violation of both natural rights and legal rights because of, of, you know you can't coerce a contract even by definition and even Blackstone says that um, so um, so I think I think Locke is problematic and that's probably why he doesn't get cited for those reasons and for many reasons. Thank you so much. Uh, could I invite Cameron, please, to, to ask your question? Hi, thanks very much. Hi. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was interested, um, you only speak about the uh, male authors. Yes. And consider you know, Hannah Moore's um, big poem on slavery and the uh, I, and I wonder to what extent that's a different kind of discourse. But also, you didn't mention uh, James Ramsey. And uh, Ramsey's, it seems to me that, that, that it's very clear in Ramsey that there is a connection between the earlier sort of critique of marriage as slavery uh -huh. and critique of slavery in general, insofar as what he's emphasizing is the, the, the soul, if you like, the, the fact that, that it is um the fact that individuals have the possibility of salvation so it's a very kind of christian uh, mm -hmm. view and so the natural freedom the natural liberty is uh necessary in order for individuals to be morally responsible for, for themselves and that's yeah. that is the argument that women have been using against the slavery of marriage mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, so what, what would you, how would you put that into what I do discuss? I appreciate your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah, I guess, I guess uh, I was. Well, I, I really, I, I, I want, I want to know more about what you're thinking, because this is precisely where I'm going next with, with my work. And I did consider bringing in Wollstonecraft. Um, as someone who, you know, is, is, is a critic of the, of the state of nature as a source of, of sex, you know, um, speculations about sex and what is, um, what is possible for men and women, you know, how different that the, their roles should be, or, you know, are claimed to be. And she's particularly criti critical of Rousseau, of course. And so it seems to me that, um, that there would have to be a, a very different sort of paper on this topic that would deal more specifically with women's uses of the state of nature at the time. Hannah Moore, I've worked on um, not as much as and so extensively on the anti-slavery poetry. Um, she does, along with other um, late romant or early romantic, you know, 1780s poets. Um, try to ventriloquize um, enslaved people in her poetry. And um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of problems created by that, which we don't have, you know, we don't have as much of um, in the writers I'm looking at because um, they're not attempting to speak for enslaved people. So again, I think that would be probably a, a different use of the state of nature and probably more aligned ultimately with Clarkson who, you know, working with sentimental appeals. Um, but I, I re appreciate your question because I definitely want to look in that direction and I'll particularly look at, at Ramsey. Did you have other thoughts or advice? No, um, I guess, uh, I mean, Hannah Moore is kind of an interesting case in the sense that in general, she's kind of against the natural, I mean, she's against the, the, the sort of uh, Whig natural right 
discourse in general. Yes. But yes. she is very influential in terms of of uh, expressing, I guess, some sort of, uh, well, I guess a Christian, a, a, a kind of Christian sentimentalism. But I just thought that she, I mean, I haven't worked on the all of this anti-slavery mm -hmm. stuff, but um, I just wondered. No, that's, that's really good advice. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I do have a dissertation student who's working on on this topic, so I'm I'm delving into some of her uh, some of her research, and this is why I've gotten interested in this this problem of personification because that's what she's um, she's noticing that um, there are these hypothetical Africans in their either in their um, natural settings who are who are intruded upon by the slave traders in a lot of these poems and of course they're anti-slavery poems um, but they it's, it's interesting that I guess I would say that the the thing that I, I realized when when working through again this talk is that it's it's a problem it seems to be liberatory to shift Africans into a state of nature constituted by the invasion of their societies but then they become um, they become sort of victims of this uh, this the, even even to some extent this theorizing that's going on because it's very simple to move them in and out of their of their polities and their social contexts for the purposes of speculating about their uh, original natural rights and I think this is something that um, Kugawano and Equiano try to avoid doing. They're not trying to, to, to reconstitute a state of nature that is that is that has been abstracted from social realities. They're just talking about the innocence of childhood, which is still within the, the African settings in, in which they, they were um, living when they were abducted. So I think it's, um, I mean, I, I just rereading what I wrote about Clarkson too, it's odd that he doesn't make the, the, the connection overtly that European uh, empires are products of conquest. You know, he has that strange notion that, you know, uh, rulers of empires have been elected by their subjects, um, which he comes up with. So um, I'll stop there, but I, but I really appreciate your suggestion. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I do have another question, but I, I don't want to impose myself if, if someone else wants to raise a point or make a comment uh, at, at this moment. So this, this is your chance to jump up if you do. Uh, and if not, um, then I will uh, uh, say what I was hoping to have the opportunity to say, which is this. Um, first of all, uh, a, a little comment, and then I, I guess quite a big question. Um, the, the little comment is that um, Diderot, in one of the articles, I forget which it is in the Encyclopédie, um, says that any exertion of will over another person is in effect a regression to a state of nature, to a Hobbesian idea of a state of nature. Oh, okay. Um, and so it would seem to me that 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 can interestingly be brought into conversation with, with the arguments that you're making, mm -hmm. such that the state of nature bookends the slavery debate. So to, to take slaves both violates the, the freedom and equality of the state of nature and for Diderot would be in itself a regression to the state of nature. And so the state of nature would be both used as, as an, a norm of equality and as something that is undesirable in, in the two bookends of that argument, which then leads to the bigger question, which is, is there anything in the state of nature motif itself, in, in your opinion, that makes it either inherently more predisposed to being used for uh, emancipatory purposes mm -hmm. or more, more sort of for reinforcing the, the status quo, part of which it, it, in the context in which it arose is, is colonization. And, and again, yeah. it, the, uh, another example would be um, the, likening people in the states of nature to, to animals. 
Um, yes. So uh, Africans are animals, the argument would go, in a way that I think one of your, your writers that you mentioned said leads to the argument for slavery. And yet mm -hmm. for others, the, the idea of wild animals makes freedom normative. So right. Is, is the state of nature just really then a blank slate mm -hmm. onto which one can project any ideology whatsoever? Or is there anything inherent in it, do you think, mm. that predisposes it more towards one of these uses than another? Well, I think that, it, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that it becomes useful when, I mean, I was talking earlier about the tendency to, to generate sympathy in some of these, in some of this abolitionist poetry by making Africans seem, you know, innocent and, um, you know, victims. And yet depriving them of the sort of status of complex civilizations in doing so. And I think that, you know, that is the, that is the, that's one example of how suggesting a state of nature is a kind of condescension that enables you to sort of reconstruct a society, but sort of displace the actual, you know, real living cultures or societies that, that you're talking about in, in a kind of speculative exercise. Um, for, for these abolitionist writers, somebody like Clarkson, I mean, he's, his treatise includes many, many, many examples of how the slave trade is actually prosecuted because he went and, and visited slave ships. And later on, as they got their, their, their um, political movement organized, it became really important to document the shackles and the slave ships, as I'm sure you, a lot of you know. Um, so it's not as if he didn't know, if he didn't have concrete evidence that he, that he also included. Um, so I think there is, a, you know, for him then an emancipatory side to suggesting that, um, and this is where maybe the, 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 the overlap between the plantation and, the, and Africa happens. It's very useful for him to suggest that when you, in, when you attack another peaceful society in order to plunder people, you revert to a state of nature which entitles them you know, to, to self-defense. And when he transfers that to the plantations, which he does, then he gets to say they, they can revolt against you. And of course, a lot of the anti, a lot of the pro-slavery forces in the British government would, would point to that sort of thing as just evidence that they couldn't possibly um, afford to, in, you know, to make any changes to the way they operate. And we, saw, we see that with, um, with uh, Long, you know, so, so, you know, it, so for him, then it becomes emancipatory. So I don't think it's necessarily one way or the other. And that's why you, you kind of try to do all this intellectual history reconstruction of where they're getting these ideas from to try to figure out, well, is this a Hobbesian versus a Lockean, you know, version of the state of nature? And it must be Lockean, but then Locke is not very helpful to the, to the abolitionists. So they won't, you know, because they're constantly talking about contract and the fact that, you know, you can't coerce people to enter into contract and things like that. But then, but then they, they can't really go there exactly because Locke is not, you know, in his historical context is not necessarily going to help them. If that's what's in their mind, it's hard to know. So I guess I wouldn't say that, that it's for sure one, one thing or the other. Um, but as I said, as part of, I was trying to sort of say that, that even when you're a reformer, um, the state of nature is useful in that it still allows you to say, you know, we can fundamentally fix this problem if we, you know, outlaw slavery and the slave trade. And therefore, it's helpful to have the idea of a blank slate so that you can make reform seem possible and palatable. Whereas, you know, as I suggested, Cuguano and Equiano are very skeptical. And so Equiano says, pay me, pay me what, you know, what I do. Um, Whereas Kuguano is just, let's blow it all up, <laughs> more or less. I mean, that's not his only rhetoric, but you know, he's 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 very suspicious. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if others you've heard you've heard a lot of discussions already from different scholars. If you have ideas about um, about what you think 
uh, you too, Chris, of course, if you think the state of nature is one or the other, uh, conservative or potentially flexible. I think we may have to reserve judgment on that just for the moment. Okay. I, I, I suspect um, the, the answer might go in the direction of, of there being mutually incompatible states of nature and, and having to, uh -huh. as, as you were doing okay. in, in your own answer, to, to distinguish yeah. perhaps between yeah. those. Um, uh, Karen, I see your hand is up. So um, this is what uh, we call in philosophy a finger on the on the question. <laughs> um, I guess, I mean, just a, a comment on, on that after all, you know, Rousseau has something like uh, a kind of Augustinian Adamic kind of state of nature. Mm -hmm. you know, everything is good. And then man corrupts. Right. Okay. Um, whereas, uh, you know, Hobbes is the state of nature is a state of war. But I thought um, maybe the other thing that's going on is this ambiguity in in liberty that you know your your writers the ones that you're talking mm -hmm. about tend to want to have this sort of adamic uh state of nature where what well, what well, what well, well what there's sort of some kind of freedom but it's not quite clear what freedom is and mm -hmm. there's a another sort of notion um of freedom i mean as um uh, uh you know, the, the idea of, of freedom as government government by reason. So that right. in some sense, uh, you can't really be free until you're uh, governed by a rational law, um, which is um, a, a kind of different, you know, in some sense, that, that notion, you can't really get uh, the movement of liberation from the state of nature. It's rather that you have to be governed by um, by reason in order to be free. And I guess that's one of the things that I thought was coming out um, in in Ramsey. And I guess it's, it's kind of very clear in in Catherine Macaulay, who was a friend of okay. Ramsey, um, okay. that, that the notion of liberty, liberty is not a sort of simple um, license to do what you will. Or freedom to do what you want, but rather uh, being governed by, uh, I guess you know, it's tied in with with the idea of 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 a free person having a conscience, because there is also the, yeah. the assumption that there is the natural law, mm -hmm. and um, understanding the natural law is the same as as I mean, there's a kind of you know, conflation of Stoicism and Christianity in the sense that, well, you know, the Stoics were right in some sense to uh, think that freedom is being governed by a rational law, but Christianity adds to that a kind of, you know, uh, humility and uh, elements that weren't there in the yeah. Stoics. But it's still this, yeah. you know, to be free, um, in a sense, to be free, you have to be civilized. At least in it, to be free, you have to be uh -huh. um, governed by by reason, and uh, I mean, so, so there are all these different, not just different kind of elements within the state of nature, but also different elements within in liberty, and the the thinkers that you're pointing to seem to be. Uh, well, both thinking of the state of nature as as kind of Adamic and good, a la Rousseau, mm -hmm. um, but also what thinking of of liberty as as something that's what I'm not quite sure. I mean, uh, maybe that's just a question, really. How they? Yeah, think. yeah. Well, I think that the that the key probably, and this is maybe where. Um, the, the human rights claim comes out uh, uh, for Equiano, which is, his text is very, very Christian as well, um, is that the two um, 
uh, elements in the state, state of nature that are extremely important that have to go together is liberty and equality. So equality is the key, human equality is the key um, component or accompaniment capacity that, it, that makes liberty so important to assert for all of these thinkers, I think. Um, and I, and so that, that, you know, to claim, to claim human equality is to claim a, a natural freedom um, at all. So that means then that this imposition of, of enslavement is a violation. Um, so that's probably the most I, I think that that is something that characterizes all of these thinkers. I mean, I put in Sharp alongside the rest because he's so contra in contractual in his thinking, but he's really not very much of a state of nature theorist, actually. Uh, but he does have his constitutionalist plans that he th thinks he can implant a new, you know, sort of ideal form of government in, in this Sierra Leone settlement, which turns out to be, you know, as impossible as, as Kukulano thought. Um, so I, I think I think liberty without equality is not possible. I don't know if uh, for Ramsey and, and Macaulay, Catherine Macaulay, whether that uh, emphasis is placed on equality as well. Um, uh, yeah, well, it is equality of liberty insofar as um, you know we're equally, um, if you like, uh, participants in God's potential grace. I mean, we are equally. Uh -huh moral individuals okay yeah. but there is a you know there's a debate to extent to a certain extent like in the history as to the extent to which uh if you like moral and spiritual equality which um yeah. uh, uh you know freedom in the sense of being morally um accountable uh for one's actions but also able to attain grace. I mean, that, that, mm -hmm. that kind of Christian idea, the extent to which that is compatible with social hierarchy. Yes. Um, you know, the, I mean, yeah. I think that, um, you know, H Hannah Moore is somebody who's kind of more emphasizing the, you know, the, the, the de degradation of slavery um, because it doesn't uh, allow the expression of uh, the slaves' uh, natural and moral uh, identity. Mm -hmm. She would also be in. I mean, when she talks in about women, definitely in favor of she's hierarchy. Actually, yeah, she actually yeah. doesn't mind hierarchy because yeah. because the the exercise. I mean, this is the goes back to Epictetus. You know, the exercise yeah. of 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 moral agency uh, is is quite possible even within. The situation of being a slave, enslaved. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, so this, this. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I just um, that was supposed to be a sort of finger, but <laughs> no, that's very that's very interesting and helpful um, at, because I it does enable me to push forward this this um, sense of equal, human equality as um, as being key to these assertions of the state of nature for all of these writers and. I mean, I didn't mention about Sharp's plan, but he he went so far. I mean, there were other <laughs> regulations that I didn't talk about, but he went so far as to make it impossible for anyone to purchase in his in his uh, you know his foundational uh, constitution for Sierra Leone. He made it impossible for anyone to purchase large tracts of land. So any large tract of land had to be juxt had to be adjacent to commons. So that nobody could become this dominant landowner. So I think he had thought through what it meant, what happened to allow the you know colonial, uh, the different colonial plantations and dominions to be developed the way they were, and uh, and decided that one thing you had to avoid at all costs was engrossing property, huge swaths of property. Um, and, and that, that, you know, social equality wouldn't be possible unless everybody's ability to engross more land was, uh, was restricted. Um, so that's, um, just, I guess that's also something that's in, uh, Catherine McCauley, 
Now, oh, good. In, in order to maintain political equality, there needs to be um, a kind of equi relatively. Yeah, I've only looked at her her educational writings, and it's been a while. I haven't really looked at. Is this her, her history? Um, uh, yeah. Um, and her there's a short thing. Um, there's a sketch of a democratical society. Um, okay. And her, her, her talk, her um, discussion of Hobbes. Okay. That uh, loose remarks on <laughs> Hobbes' rud rudiments of, uh, of government. It's called. I think there's um there's uh, somebody who's just editing now um, for the Cambridge Political Philosophy series. Oh, good. Uh, her political it's you know, extracts and and her political essays. So, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, for those Coming recommendations, I appreciate it. As I said, I'm going to be working on the the women. Yeah. Uh, and writers. Also, uh, Macaulay was also a friend friend of James Ramsey. There's a okay. I published her correspondence with. Um, okay. Uh, there's a correspondence there, but uh, anyway. I, I I will definitely look at that. Thanks. And what a wonderful exchange to to finish on. We we have trespassed a couple of minutes over the end time, so I I will oh. uh, have to wrap things up uh, now. Just before we uh, thank. Uh, Professor Sarah Winter for a wonderful paper and very generous responses to, to the different questions. Can I just draw your attention uh, to something I'm just sharing in the chat here, which is the details of the next seminar. Um, it's going to be uh, Professor Christopher Kelly of Boston College, uh, who is going to speak on Rousseau's States of Nature. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be Wednesday, the 26th of October at 9 a.m. Melbourne time. And there's a, a link uh, to sign up for that in the uh, in the chat now. Um, Sarah, thank you so much uh, for, for your generosity, uh, for everything that you've shared with us. We've all got a great deal to go away and think about. Uh, please join me. Thank you so everybody, much. In um, I really Sarah appreciate I really appreciate everyone coming so early in the morning uh, uh, at your time and, um, and, and, and your um, contributions and suggestions. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care, everyone.